first, I want to just let everybody know one more time, if you didn't hear me, that uh, the close, we are using a closed captioning system called Otter. It is activated um, and it is in the, the bottom right of your screen. If it bothers you, you want to turn it off, just click that button and disable it um, and you, it will go away for you. Um, and then if you have questions, I just want to remind people you can answer those in the Q&A um, and we'll save those for the end. Um, and also we're recording the presentation tonight um, and it will be available for a limited time. Actually, I think we're going to keep it up on um, YouTube. So we'll send out the link to everybody who registered for this event. Um, so you can watch it at your leisure, watch it again um, after the event. And with that, I just want to say uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the Seattle Architecture Foundation, um, we are a nonprofit organization with the mission of connecting people to the architecture, design and history of Seattle. We believe that the more you engage with design, the more you feel connected to your changing city. Um, and SAF provides tours, talks, programs for kids and youth and families, um, exhibits and special events. During these times, most of our programs are operated in the virtual space, um, but we are offering small group tours, um, private tours, on-demand tours through our mobile app, and we've been continuing our youth, youth programs virtually. So we still have a lot going on um, during these times. Um, we've been able to continue our programming um, thanks to the generosity of our members and our sponsors. Um, if you are interested in supporting our work um, and continued programs, I encourage you to make a donation or join as a member if you're not already. I know many of you are already members and I just want to say thank you. It's uh, the foundation of um, support for the organization and it really does make a huge difference, especially right now. Um, I want to, the Seattle Architecture Foundation acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Suquamish people, the people forced to relocate, but who have persevered. SAF used the history of Seattle to include from time immemorial to today, and is committed to exploring that through its partnerships and programs. Tonight, I, I don't think I introduced myself to everybody, but I am um, Stacy Siegel, the executive director. I haven't seen many of you, so if you don't recognize me, that's who I am. Um, but I... But with that, I want to turn it over to um, introduce you to our speaker tonight. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Larry Kreisman as tonight's speaker. Um, Larry has played an important role in SAF's history as our former program director and co-founder of our tours program. And he, and he also helped produce the exhibit Blueprints, 100 Years of Seattle Architecture, which was a Mohai exhibit, which found a semi-permanent home in um, SAF's old office, which was in Rainier Tower, um, which many of you probably saw um, during our time there. Most of you also may know Larry as the former director of Historic Seattle for 20 years. Larry has been recognized for significant work in bringing public attention to the North, North, to the Northwest architectural heritage and its preservation through courses, tours, exhibitions, lectures, articles, and 11 books. Larry has had an illustrious career. We are just so lucky to have him here tonight. Um, I'm really excited to hear this talk. Um, I have not heard it ever before. Um, and I want to remind everyone of the importance of supporting our local historic theaters. Theaters across the state have been devastated by the pandemic and will have a tough time making capital improvements to reopen safely. Um, I, I urge you to advocate for historic theaters across our state by sending an email to our legislators in support of the historic theater grant program. Um, our friends at Washington Trust for Historic Preservation have created kind of a simple link, which I'll post in just a second um, if you want to send a note. But really, the theaters are instrumental to our economy and our heritage, and I am just delighted to have Larry tell you more about them um, in his talk tonight. So with that, I think, Larry, I am going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, and thank you, Stacy, for plugging the, uh, the importance of uh, theater as we go into this opportunity for staying at home rather than going to theaters, but I hope that won't change. Um, uh, I, um, I am also grateful to the Seattle Architecture Foundation because for so many years um, I met with so many wonderful people through the foundation and through our volunteer uh, tour committee. Um, some of you who are on the, the program tonight um, and uh, I do believe that um, education in architecture is a really significant thing to do, particularly in this era when we're all mostly virtual and aren't getting out into the street as much, but um, hopefully we'll be looking at buildings for a long time and they will give us joy. Um, 
So, and I'm going to turn off my face so you can just enjoy the pictures. That's me when I was about uh, eight years old with my sister. Um, thought I'd start with a little family personal note. Uh, I was about eight years old uh, when my parents took me to see my first opera at the old Metropolitan Opera House in New York. And I remember the agonizing climb up each flight of steps as expecting to open up to the the, the grand space, but finding myself mounting more stairs and more stairs and more stairs and more landings, uh, promptly deflating <coughs> as uh, I, I, I never saw the end of it. And finally at the top, we entered the family circle, which was actually above the ceiling you see here. <clears throat> and um, it opened to my view. There was gold leaf and gold lattice work, gold cupids, gold curtain, gold chandeliers red velvet, crystal. And even after the lights dimmed and the curtain rose, my attention focused on the names of the composers that are carved around the Persinium Arch. More so actually than what was on the stage. And undoubtedly it was the, the magic of the old Met where fantasy and art merged every evening and twice on Saturday that awakened my interest in architecture and the design arts and the eclectic and exotic world of theaters. Seattle has a remarkable entertainment history. And uh, in 1981, I was curator of an exhibition at the Museum of History and Industry called Another Note, Another Opening, Another Show that highlighted some of the history of this wonderful city with photographs, architectural fragments, drawings, renderings, posters, furniture, and costumes. At the time, it also allowed me to <clears throat> prepare several articles that outlined the theater history, including the instrumental entrepreneurs and the theater developers, the local architects and the design professionals, and the theaters that made these men nationally famous. And uh, as Stacy mentioned in 1994, as the lead curator of Blueprints, 100 Years of Seattle Architecture, which celebrated the centennial of the American Institute of Architects in Seattle and Washington State, I included a section on the entertainment industry. <clears throat> Perhaps some of you have managed to see that as it was reinstalled at the Seattle Architectural Foundation Gallery in the um, now demolished Rainier Square. And it continued to teach about built heritage until SAF moved to its new home. Our theaters offer a colorful architectural history made even more interesting through the recollections of the people who worked in and performed in these theaters and the public who attended shows there. For its youth and size, Seattle had a broad ranging reputation in entertainment. In fact, in 1909, it was reputed to be second only to New York in the number and variety of live offerings. It was the home and training ground for theater entrepreneurs who ultimately established national and international empires. John Court, Alexander Pantages, Sullivan and Considine. Others, including John Han Hanna, James Clemmer, Russell and Drew, John Hamrick, Jensen and Van Herberg, and John Dance, built substantial local or regional organizations. Seattle's premier theater architects, B. Marcus Pratika, E. W. Houghton, and R. C. Reamer, also built reputations that extended far beyond the city. Only a small number of Seattle's many legitimate stage houses, vaudeville and motion picture palaces are still intact. And that makes those that survive all the more important in keeping alive the social importance that theater had to this community. <clears throat> to see how far Seattle came in a very short period, we could sample some of the contemporary reporting about Seattle's first entertainment district, today's Pioneer Square. It was rough, rowdy and homegrown like the town itself, and directed toward the many single men who came west to work in the lumber camps, coal mines, and shipping. Because of the questionable morals of these places, the city established an ordinance requiring the entertainment district to be stricted to south of Yesler Way. There were a few exceptions, such as Squire's Opera House um, and later uh, Fry's Opera House, both of which burned down in the 1889 fire. 
the Seattle Theater, um, which was built in 1892 at Third and Cherry Street, and you can see it uh, in the behind the foreground building on the right hand side. Uh, on the, the following block is the Seattle Theater. Um, it replaced um, those older theaters, and it became the city's leading venue for variety and later for programs that appeared vaudeville with silent films. Mark Twain appeared here in 1895 during a lengthy lecture tour in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Another uh, was Cordry's Opera House, later called the Third Avenue Theater. But from Yesler to Jackson Street, entertainment became increasingly less highbrow. Here's how a writer from Coast Magazine described the scene in 1902 when he visited the Washington Street Theater. The place was located in a basement under a liquor saloon and a cigar stand. Into the moldy and uncomfortable depths, the pure atmosphere and sunlight never have an opportunity to enter. A nervous opium eating individual was hammering away at a piano. Not a woman was to be seen in the rows of seats, only men smoking and chewing tobacco and boys eating peanuts. Around the side and opposite the stage were small apartments with an opening toward the platform. In each room was an electric touch button which communicated with the bar fitted behind the stage. The boxes were unlighted, save as a stray beam might enter from the windows. In these places were women, one in some, more in others. Women with dresses reaching nearly to the point above their knees, with stained and sweaty tights, bare arms and necks uncovered over halfway to their waists, with blondened hair and some with powdered wigs, with faces rouged and powdered, lips dyed crimson with paint, eyebrows and winkers smutted up and blackened. There stood the female contingency at the doors and the boxes. The new standard, which was John Court's Spanish Moorish brick building, which you see here, was built at Occidental and Washington Street after the Seattle fire to replace the old standard. And until 1894 was the stock company and a variety house. Later, as the lyric, it was initially a musical comedy house, but its fare changed as new and improved theaters spread northward. One of Seattle's well-known real estate developers, Henry Broderick, recalled the lyric theater in its later years as a rendezvous, quote, for robust bowdy, rowdies of both sexes. Here's what he wrote. The stage show was more or less a blind for the real curriculum of Boy Meets Girls, where waitresses offered shenanigans at market prices. It was patronized by loggers, stevedores, carnies, pimps, parasites, con men, and the lower types of etc. The elite of the town were seen there occasionally on slumming tours in order to get a glimpse of the authentic underworld. It was the only place in town where one could be in a theater and a bordello at the same time. Well, Seattle's early lack of sophistication gave way to a growing demand to be up to date, both in terms of entertainment, the leading stars, the latest film and vaudeville programs, and in terms of theater design, increasingly more elaborate and exotic. Local theatrical showmen imported stage entertainment to satisfy the extremes of taste, education, and culture, and of course, made money doing it. Competition for paying customers intensified, and showmen catered to the comforts of customers in a way unheard of, except in royal households. John Court, who eventually operated 1,200 theaters coast to coast, lobbied the city to change its entertainment boundaries to allow for theaters north of Yesler Way opening the opportunity for his Romanesque Grand Opera House on Cherry Street to offer legitimate entertainment for a more respectable clientele. The local press with Civic Booster Pride had a field day describing the opening gala in December, 1900. Here it goes. <clears throat> Seattle's new theater was opened in a blaze of glory and has proven to be a grand success. The baptismal last evening at the hands of Governor-elect John McGraw with a glittering surrounding of beauty, wealth, and culture as sponsors made the occasion the crowning achievement in the social history of Seattle and adds one more handsome feature to the many attractions already in and about this beautiful city. Hundreds of the representative people of Seattle sitting in the luxurious seats and criti critically surveying the magnificent appearance of this new theater 
raised for their aesthetic enjoyment and waiting for their dedication blessing, simultaneously seem moved by one magnetic pulse throbbing in strong unison, one harmonious thought which guided all into expressions of rapturous approval. The verdict of delight was unanimous. The most fastidious taste was satisfied. Well, E.W. Houghton, the designer of the Grand Opera House, would have been quite saddened by the fire which gutted the Opera House in 1913. And you may recognize its shell as the parking garage that has been there for most of its existence off Cherry Street and Third Avenue. Houghton was in great demand, designing nearly 100 vaudeville and film houses throughout the West. One of his works was converting a skating rink at Third Avenue and James Street into the Coliseum Vaudeville in 1907, promoted as, quote, the biggest theater this side of Chicago. The Post-Intelligencer reported, quote, last night they turned out on something like 1500 electric lights around the corner of Third and James. The event had been well-planned and everything went off without a hitch. The regular patrons of vaudeville and those who are making its acquaintance for the first time packing the house that holds more than any theater on a single floor this side of Chicago. The first thing to happen after the crowd filled up the 2700 seats was the appearance of the orchestra and then there was some expectancy until the playing of the Star Spangled Banner brought the patriotic ones to their feet which was followed by a general acceptance of the hint by the entire audience. All of the 22 boxes were filled by people who are not usually seen at vaudeville performances, who applauded as hard as any of the faithful followers. So it was called the Block Long Theater, and it was so long that only visual acts had the power to carry to the last rows. Uh, but all of the Sullivan Considine houses were large, none seated less than 1,800 people. A 1911 Seattle Post Intelligencer article said, quote, the section at the back of the theater was called Bellingham. The most densely developed entertainment district between 1905 and 1915 was Second Avenue, spilling over to First, Third, and Fourth Avenues. One of the earliest of these at First and Madison began life as the Star Theater in 1905 under the ownership of John Considine. Its name changed to the State Movie Theater and finally to the Rivoli. Stage acts had been all or part of the entertainment here since 1905. But years later during the Second World War, the more loving and or libidinous urges of young soldiers moved the Rivoli to quote, refine its vaudeville policy into programs that mixed B movies with the refined art of removing clothes. The Palace Hip Theater at the southeast corner of 2nd Avenue in Spring opened as the Majestic in 1909, changed to the Empress less than two years later, and then in 1916, with a remodel into a Greco-Byzantine interior of ivory and gold and 1,500 seats, it turned over again into the Palace Hippodrome. Soon after the summer opening, the Seattle Times surveyed its wonderful construction, quote, the entire designing and constructing of the Majestic Theater somewhat over five months from the date of John Considine's order is an apt illustration of the Seattle theater spirit. Considine was a super impresario and Edwin W. Houghton, the happy if frantic architect who proudly revealed to the Times reporter, quote, I was fortunate enough to have a client that had good enough judgment to select an architect whom he thought was capable and then leave him to do it. While the theater's dog acts were often splendid, they were but one of ordinarily six or seven acts that took to the stage twice a day. By some accounts, it was Seattle's greatest house of vaudeville. Of the hundreds upon hundreds of acts, comedy, song and dance, animal acts that landed here for a run of a week or two, Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel, later of Laurel and Hardy, are the most abiding names. Houghton's most important work in Seattle is the Moore Theater and the Hotel in 1907 on 2nd and Virginia Street, a daring venture considering how far it was from the existing entertainment district. Constructed with reinforced concrete, 
the innovative structure called for a huge steel girder that extended the width of the theater and supported the weight of the balcony in the steel and concrete sidewalls. This eliminated support columns that might block views of the stage. The project was developed partly for tourists to the 1909 Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition and included the theater, a hotel, and a basement swimming pool. As the leading culture house in the city prior to the opening of the Metropolitan Theater in 1911, the Moore hosted celebrities from all the performing arts, including Marie Dressler, Ethel Barrymore, Anna Pavlova, Sergei Rachmaninoff, and Fyodor Shalyapin. An opulent lobby and auditorium barred freely from Italianate and Byzantine styles in marble, onyx, and mosaics. Allegorical figures representing the arts and music and dance supported the beams below the foyer dome, and the auditorium originally had 26 private boxes, as well as indirect lighting achieved by colored glass set behind scrollwork bands. And you can still see those today when you go to the theater. Into the 1960s, it also restricted Negroes to the top balcony. And there was a separate entrance on the side street so that they did not have to mingle or shouldn't be seen with the regular crowd in the gracious public spaces. People of color and Asians had to, to find more accepting and welcoming gathering places. The Nippon Khan Theater opened in 1909, provided that kind of performance space for the Asian community for nearly a century. In 1911, Considine, of the Coliseum vaudeville, you remember, recognized that Uptown was where entertainment was moving. So he relocated to Third Avenue and Madison Street, unveiling his palatial Orpheum Theater, designed by William Kingsley. It later was known as the Woodward, the High League, the President, the Ritz, and the Third Avenue before it ended up as storage and USO for Black servicemen during World War II. At the opening, reporters raved about, quote, the magnificent marble and onyx grand foyer reflected in its many panels of mosaic glass, the profusion of floral decorations, which made this already wonderful reception chamber at once a garden and a palace. A particular pride was the use of local materials in the building's construction. Judge Thomas Burke said, quote, this beautiful building, fireproof and well-appointed in every particular of the minutest, has this permanency. Every dollar's worth of materials that has gone into the building, every hour of labor that has been put upon this building, comes from the city of Seattle. Every piece of material that could be purchased here, and the labor and all the artisans, the skilled artists, the skilled architects, which went to produce this building, came from the city of Seattle. The beautiful mosaics in the grand foyer were not brought from New York or Chicago, but were made here in this city and put up by skilled artisans of this city. Seattle architect Paul Henderson Ryan designed the Liberty Theater in 1914 at First Avenue and Pike Street. There's our own statue. It showcased the first of many subsequent Wurlitzer organs used to accompany silent films. Further north and east at Fifth Avenue and Pine Street, the Alhambra, later called the Wilkes, opened in 1909 with 1,600 seats. It presented vaudeville, musical comedy, melodrama, and photo plays, sometimes mixed and other times as committed specialties. But by 1921, it was to become a motion picture house solely and ending the run of the Wilkes Stock Company, which used it for live performance. By the summer of 1922, however, the Wilts had become a venue not for film or theaters, but for political rallies and other temporary uses, like worship for the Fourth Church of Christ scientists before they moved into their new building on First Hill. These motion picture and vaudeville theaters developed east of Second Avenue along Pike, Pine, and Olive Way, so that by 1930, Westlake and Fifth Avenue were the theater magnets of the city. From the Metropolitan Theater on the University Street northward to the Fifth Avenue, the Blue Mouse, the Music Box, the Coliseum, and the Orpheum at Westlake, during the 20s and 30s, Fifth Avenue was the street of choice for entertainment, our Broadway. The impetus for the move may have been the opening of the Metropolitan Theater between Fourth and Fifth Avenue on University Street. 
built in 1911 to designs by Howells and Stokes and A.H. Albertson, who had been brought to Seattle to supervise the development of the 10-acre University of Washington site into a multi-building commercial uh, center to be called Metropolitan Center. The 1400 seats theater became the focal point of legitimate theater in Seattle for more than 40 years. Major theater stars and concert artists, Al Jolson, Ethel Barrymore, Mary Garden, Geraldine Farrar, Gertrude Lawrence, Victor Borg performed on its stage. The architects who had also designed the Cobb building and the White Henry Stewart building nearby designed a compatible facade of graded buff colored brick with semi-round arched windows and white terracotta trim. The brick pattern work on the facade was suggested by the marble block pattern on the facade of the Palace of the Doges in Venice. A marquee of ornamental iron and glass was brilliantly lit at night. French Renaissance interiors were completed with white Italian marble and black Belgian mosaics and ter terrazzo panels. There were bronze and copper handrails and fixtures and art glass. And of course, the theater was demolished to make way for the ballroom addition and drive-in entry to the Olympic Hotel. The early vaudeville ventures of Greek-born Alexander Pantages in Seattle, the Crystal, Louisa, and Pantages vaudeville, were rewarded, and he embarked on larger and larger projects. From his profits, he was able to build a handsome Seattle residence in Washington Park. B. Marcus Pratica worked for E.W. Houghton until at age 21, he was hired by Alexander Pantages to design the San Francisco Pantages. Its opening in 1911 marked the beginning of a long and successful partnership. This, however, is the Seattle Pantages, which you're looking at now. Their classic Greek facades became the symbol of Greek theater showmen. In 1915, his 1900 seat Seattle Pantages at 3rd and University Street became the flagship of what in 1926 had become a 72 theater chain in the US and Canada, which meant that traveling stage acts could be contracted for over a year of work and deals could be made. Like the Seattle Pantages and the surviving Pantages in Tacoma, many of the bigger theaters were fronted by office blocks. Because this was also the anchor for Pantages' chain of theaters, the grand promoter himself took many of these offices facing Third Avenue, as did B. Marcus Pratica. The standard fare at the Pantages circuit was a mix of vaudeville and film, and some famous performers, Al Jolson, Buster Keaton, Sophie Tucker, appeared. After the Pantages became the Palomar in 1936, and then it was owned and operated by John Dans and his Sterling Theater Company, film continued with a mix of stage acts and Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Peggy Lee, and Frank Sinatra appeared on the stage. Pratika also designed theaters for Warner Brothers, the Orpheum Circuit, and Sterling Theaters, completing 60 major theaters and 160 lesser theaters during his career. His most flamboyant work in Seattle was the Coliseum Theater at Fifth and Pike Street. And what you're seeing here is his actual handwritten notebook of uh, notes he made during the construction of the Coliseum Theater in 1915-16. Theater has an interesting history. The C.D. Stimson Company acquired the property at Fifth and Pike Street in 1914. C.D. and Joe Gottstein discussed at length the idea of a theater on the downtown site Gottstein, at 24 and fresh out of Brown University, recalled years later that he had originally gotten involved in the Coliseum venture because Washington State had gone dry, putting his father's liquor business on the rocks, as he said. The theater was his first major business enterprise. With a, a foresight that anticipated a growing market, Stimson and Gottstein chose to build a theater exclusively for film. Although the Coliseum was built without a conventional stage, all, uh, the handsome Presidium Arch framed the silver screen and the back wall of the theater. Plans for future development into an opera house would have been feasible with expansion into the then vacant half block to the north. The 1900-seat theater opened in January of 1916. It was billed as a motion picture palace, the first true one, 
And while this was not totally true, the Liberty and the Colonial Theaters in downtown had also been designed exclusively for film, local advertisements loved to proclaim it, quote, the world's largest and finest photoplay palace. And certainly for a time, it was the costliest and probably the most elaborately decorated motion picture theater, if not in the world, as some claimed, at least west of major population centers in New York and Chicago. Thousands of curious theater goers bought tickets ranging from 15 cents to 50 cents for the privilege of viewing the exotic interior and the theater's first film, The Cheat, starring Fanny Ward, accompanied by the music of an eight-piece Russian orchestra. The Coliseum's innovative design and acoustics influenced theaters nationwide. It became a prototype for the American Motion Picture Palace. Its exuberant Italian Renaissance styled facade demonstrated the high degree of detail that could be attained with architectural terracotta. The cornice and the Roman styled incised letters of the name Coliseum were illuminated by light bulbs placed in the recesses. The most Impressive feature was probably the uh, dome and the coffered vestibule at the corner of Fifth and Pike. The dome acted as a magnet for drawing people to the ticket booth and the generous ornamented ironwork and stained glass that was added later uh, extended the length of the theater and welcomed shelters during the rainy season and also were good for window shoppers in the six retail outlets. Its white glazed terracotta had been manufactured locally at the Auburn plant of the Northern Clay Company, which later was taken over by Gladding McBean in the California. Let's go back to that. The Roman exterior could only hint at the eclectic fantasies awaiting moviegoers inside. They entered an Egyptian inspired lobby decorated in bright Byzantine orange offset with black, pale greens and dull reds. Sorry, have no color pictures. Uh, but the lotus flower, a sacred symbol of regeneration and fertility to the Egyptians was used thematically here and in the theater auditorium. Oval domes overhead were surrounded by painted allegorical figures of Cleopatra's Egypt. Mosaic carpeting was set off by soft gray and black furnishings and sculptured wall designs. The exoticism of the theater extended to a Turkish men's smoking room, a Japanese styled lounge for the ladies and a children's nursery with mother goose figures and ducks decorating the walls. The theater had one balcony and an innovation of pratikas to theater design, a mezzanine level designed to fill the acoustical dead space formed by the balcony. Both were reached by ramps, stairs and an elevator with a 27 person capacity reputed to be the first elevator in a picture house. There were excellent sight lines, indirect lighting, um, accented by decorative elements. And um, originally organ pipes decorated the side of the proscenium and two electric fountains illuminated each side of the orchestra pit. 30 canaries sang in the upstairs foyer. The valance of the giant stage curtain featured embroidered lotus, flower, embroidered lotus flowers. And then of course there was that wonderful medallion of Cleopatra reclining. Uh, above the stage. And again, these plaster grotesques, which you saw throughout the theater. Um, the theater was steeply graded. And if the movie was less than absorbing, the patrons could always look up at the display of the evening heavens, the Big Dipper and the North Star sparkling electrically over the balcony. The entrance and the interior all but disappeared during a 1950 refurbishment that also covered the original proscenium with a new sculptural one to accommodate the larger screen, ironically done by B. Marcus Pratica. But its future viability, like that of many downtown theaters, was in danger. And in 1995, the interior became the Seattle retail outlet, Banana Republic. However, its landmark status required that the retail design be reversible should a future owner wish to turn it back into a performing space. So as I understand that the Banana Republic is no longer in the store, it could be a, an opportunity for some of you listening to um, take advantage of that and return it to theater use. There was more to theater than the performance inside. Promoting theaters developed into an industry involving posters, 
lobby cards, newspaper advertising, giveaway promotions, and street performances with extravagant costumes. Elaborate themed floats and parades traveled the busiest thoroughfares downtown to publicize the latest films. Photographer Frank Jacobs made a name for himself documenting these events for the Coliseum, Liberty, Strand, and other theaters, theaters in the mid-1920s. Here are just a few of his uh, documentations. And while I know this is not considered to be very PC these days, the Strand Theater in this, these pictures promoted the, the Western, the Scarlet West by having Native Americans stand out front and with an Indian hunt for schoolboys on Saturday mornings. Large organizations overseeing Pacific Northwest theaters, as well as small independent neighborhood theater owners, celebrated their success with dinners, special programs, and star attractions. The opening of a new downtown or neighborhood theater was an opportunity for special invitations, where the theater owners and managers would do what they could to provide over-the-top experiences to encourage attendance in a very competitive marketplace. <clears throat> By 1924, Robert Chambers Reamer, best known nationally for his design of lodges and outbuildings at Yellowstone Park, had become the chief architect for the Metropolitan Building Company. In that capacity, his firm designed the Skinner Building and its Chinese-inspired Fifth Avenue Theater, which opened in September 1926. He later designed the Spanish Renaissance Mount Baker Theater in Bellingham and the Art Deco Fox Theater in Spokane. The Skinner Building, represented a successful adaptation of Italian Renaissance design to an office block. But it belied the exotic and entirely extraordinary interior of the Fifth Avenue within, which was reputed to be the largest and most authentic example of traditional Chinese timber architecture and decoration outside of Asia. One and a half million dollars was spent on the wonderful interiors which were modeled after the Summer Palace, the Temple of Heavenly Peace, and the Throne Room of the Imperial Palace in Peking's Forbidden City. Its ornate walls and domed ceiling with its guardian dragon centerpiece duplicate in plaster the traditional Chinese heavy timber columns, beams, brackets, and coffering for which Imperial China was known. Interior design was largely the work of Gustav Lielström, trained in China and chief designer for the S&J Gump Company in San Francisco. The opening night program educated theater goers to the splendors around and above them. Perhaps its most imposing feature is the Great Dome, as elsewhere throughout the theater, its symbolic themes borrowed from Chinese legends, its motifs from Chinese poetry. Coiled within an azure sphere and surrounded by glowing hues of clawed red, emblematic of calamity and warfare, blue of rain, green symbolic of plague, black of floods, and gold of prosperity, is the great dragon, guardian of the heavens and foe of evil spirits. He is, indeed, the brooding genius of the place, his presence shadowed and multiplied in varying shapes and forms throughout the structure. Well, poetry and legend were not only the province of the architecture, but of the architect as well. In a misty romantic homage to R.C. Reamer, the program painted him as an almost godlike person in terms of weaver of dreams. And um, I'm going to read you this because it's probably too small for you to see on your screen. It says, from kings he borrows and from dynasties, dipping into the coffers of the past for his materials. To the castle of a Saxon monarch, he goes for staunchness and solidity to a temple of Ilium for beauty, to be fashioned into forms of majesty and grace. A Grecian urn yields him a perfect line, a Pompeian frieze, perhaps a rhythm, rhythmic pattern. In a Byzantine seraglio or a Mohammedan mosque, he may find his colors, and from the palace of a Chinese emperor, take what he desires of richness and magnificence, of poetry and symmetry, of works of structural skill and exquisite craftsmanship, with which to materialize his vision. Then with a genius that is all his own, he shapes it out of his inner consciousness, conjuring it into the thing of coordinated beauty, 
that stands forth at last an edifice. Thus does he create the weaver of dreams, designer of this building and this theater, R.C. Reamer, the architect. And I'm sure all of you architects listening agree completely. The theater's opening was a major event. Those fortunate enough to hold tickets would pass under the, paint, the painted beams to the vestibule through golden doors into a foyer inspired by the Summer Palace. They would review an exquisite opening night program with tipped in colored plates of Chinese scenes while their eyes gazed around them at the walls and ceiling treatments. The program for opening night featured guest organist Oliver Wallace on the ascending Wurlitzer, a filmed travelogue, Lipschultz and his syncopating soloists in a musicale appropriately entitled Oriental, a scenic poem filmed by Robert Bruce, the Fanchon and Marco stage show featuring Boyce Comby and the Sunkissed Beauty Review, and the feature film that night, which was Cecil B. DeMille's Young April. As with many such theaters from coast to coast, the 2400 seat house became uneconomical as a motion picture house and closed its doors in 1978. The threat of its demolition, demolition made way to make way for a shopping mall or office space brought 43 of the area's leading businesses together in a rare showing of support. The Fifth Avenue Theater Association, a nonprofit organization was founded with the express purpose of providing Seattle with a much needed performing arts facility. And theater architect Richard McCann, who had worked for and taken over the firm of B. Marcus Patika, was in charge of the renovation. The seat numbers were reduced, the slope of the main floor adjusted, uh, new ventilation, air conditioning, and stage lighting and sound systems installed. The interior walls and ceilings were cleaned and where necessary repainted in colors as closely as possible matching the originals. So new carpeting, reupholstering, original furnishings, restoring lighting fixtures resulted in the recreation of the theater as it must have been on opening night 1926. With $2.6 million renovation, it set a unique precedent in American theater history, being the first theater of that scale to be developed without any public funding. The opening of the Fifth Avenue and the opening of John Hamrick's Music Box Theater, midway between Fifth Avenue and the Coliseum, and you can see the remnants of the cast stone uh, window openings of the Music Box at the Pacific City Center building, um, completed an entertainment district that stretched from Metropolitan North to the Orpheum Theater. Smaller theaters like the Music Box, um, the Blue Mouse Theater, and the Capitol were popular. But for a special night out or a major studio first run picture, you wanted to go and be seen at one of the city's top venues. And on the heels of the opening of the Fifth Avenue, the Orpheum filled the bill. When it opened on Times Square in the summer of 1927, the Orpheum was the largest venue for film and vaudeville in the Pacific Northwest. However, in six months, the distinction of its 2,700 seats was surpassed only six blocks away when the Seattle Theater, then later called the Paramount, opened with 3,000 seats. And the Paramount, of course, has survived while the Orpheum was raised in 1967 with hardly a protest. This Spanish Renaissance masterpiece was one of Critica's great theaters. And in spite of the squeeze of its location, his Orpheum was in every part sumptuous from sidewalk to sky. Meant for Vaudeville, as well as films, it had 14 dressing rooms, all but two with baths. And in later years, it also provided a home for the Seattle Symphony before the Opera House opened in 1962. In the mid 1960s, the unique three block diagonal cut of Westlake from its origins on 4th and Pike to 6th, 6th Avenue in Virginia was being discussed as the best place to create a civic center that Seattle did not have since the city's commercial interest moved north into the retail neighborhood. This aura of progress by building something new and modern surely dampened preservationist enthusiasm for the Orpheum. As it happened, these plans did not succeed and the site became home for the first of two round towers for the Westin Hotel. Right after the two day auction of its lavish appointments, including the marble cut from floors and walls, the theater was destroyed. Surprisingly, the teardown took so long it broke the record's budget. 
the sturdy Orpheum was more reluctant than expected. The Music Hall at 7th and Olive and the Paramount at 9th Avenue and Pine pushed the theater district further east and perhaps too far east as both theaters had difficulty maintaining audiences during the Depression years. The Music Hall of 1929 was designed by Sherwin Ford who also had designed the Washington Athletic Club. Originally called the Mayflower, and the name was changed before the opening, it was designed with a flamboyant Spanish Baroque exterior with fluted columns, rich decorative bas-reliefs surrounding its colored glass windows. The theater hosted Fanny Bryce, George Jessel, Martha Graham, Yehudi Minuin, Catherine Hepburn, and many other stars of the world of music and dance and drama until, under varying changing ownerships. The interior features included a mock timbered vaulted ceiling in the lobby, ornate chandeliers, and an eclectic assortment of scroll work surrounding the proscenium. The theme of exploration was exploited in the maritime images of ships, wheels, and prows that embellished the organ grills. A lovely mezzanine lounge extended along the Olive Street side, lit by the filtered light of colored glass. After lengthy public hearings, the landmark status of the music hall was removed, and despite efforts by allied arts and other local groups to stop it, the building was stripped of its interiors and exterior cast stone and demolished during 91-92. Demolition prompted the city to establish a new Landmarks Theater Preservation Ordinance to safeguard the city's remaining landmark theaters. <clears throat> the Paramount Theater has had a better outcome. Opened as the Seattle Theater in 1928, the 3,000-seat Paramount was billed as the largest and most beautiful theater west of Chicago. Its architects, Rap and Rap, were responsible for the New York Paramount and many other motion picture theaters. In Seattle, they affiliated with B. Marcus Patrika. While the theater and the studio building were extremely quite restrained, the designer spared no expense to provide the public with a lavish interior modeled predominantly after French Renaissance palaces. A progression of spaces leads from the box office to a colonnaded foyer and into a grand hall with two magnificent bronze and crystal chandelier overhead and tiers of lobbies. At one end of the foyer on the mezzanine level was a salon de musique with a white and gold player piano for intermission entertainment. The boldly ornamented auditorium utilized inverted domes with hidden lights, draperies and textured walls and ceilings with many carved ornamental surfaces to create distortion-free sound. The Paramount organ, the Wurlitzer, was the largest in the world when it was installed. The Great Depression closed the theater temporarily and when it reopened, it was strictly a movie house. And during a year of change, years of changing ownership and management, nearly all of the original sculpture, ornamental furniture and paintings disappeared. Fortunately, the Wurlitzer was left intact and it remains one of only 10 public theater organs left in the world. In 1981, under new ownership, uh, a refurbishment of the theater proceeded uh, with uh, the supervision of Ray Shepherdson, whose credits had included the renovation of Playhouse Square in Cleveland. It was largely cosmetic and the theater reopened as a live concert hall, but in 1994, theater closed again for a complete upgrade and restoration uh, by Ida Coles and the Seattle Landmarks Association with the architectural services of MBBJ. And at that time, an addition extended the stage in the loading dock and added dressing rooms. The ongoing stewardship of the Seattle Theater Group of the Paramount and more recently the Moore and Neptune Theaters shows that these buildings are valuable community assets. Tangential to our discussion of downtown theaters is the Fraternal Order of the Eagles at 7th and Union, which was built to designs by Henry Bittman um, and a lovely Renaissance Revival style building with a terracotta facade um, that had housing on the exterior and uh, a large ballroom, which became uh, the Act Theater main space several years later. And, and uh, further north in, in where Seattle Center is, was the, the Civic Auditorium, which was used for a variety of groups. And the building never was an ideal place for either the symphony or opera or dance. So it was remodeled into an opera house that opened for Century 21. And again, it was a B. Marcus Pratica who was involved in that. 
And then it faced the reconstruction totally with uh, turning it into McCall Hall in 2003. The depression halted most new theater openings. However, in 1933, the Pike Street Theater opened with a fine art deco facade. <coughs> it closed as the town theater in 1986, but for most of its life, it was called the Roosevelt. To either side of the stage were large portraits of Franklin and Teddy. B. Marcus Pratica actually prepared these maps in the in 1940s. In 1941, the city directory showed 44 motion picture theaters listed and most of them, 26, were out in the neighborhoods. By then, most of the downtown theaters were at its north end and along with major retailers. So within three blocks of the Roosevelt were nine others, the Blue Mouse, the Capitol, the Coliseum, the Embassy, the Fifth Avenue, the Music Box, Orpheum, Colonial, and the Winter Garden. Of these, only the Fifth Avenue Theater survives. Movie theaters proliferated, however, in developing neighborhoods throughout the city. They offered, relied on historical themes or escapist exoticism of foreign lands on a smaller scale than the downtown palaces. On Capitol Hill, there was the Venetian and the Broadway. Further east was the Roycroft on 19th Avenue, now the Russian Center. West Seattle had its Admiral and Granada, the University District had the Neptune and the Egyptian. And in Ballard, the Roxy was a popular spot on Market Street. In the far south end of the Columbia City Theater preserves the single screen, while other cities, including New York, have recently lost the last surviving single screen movie theater called the Paris. The Spanish colonial revival Woodland was the pride of its North End community. The large number of downtown and neighborhood theaters can also be tied to Seattle's role as the major film distribution center in the Pacific Northwest. The Jewel Box on 2nd Avenue previewed films for regional theater managers. Some film companies had their own buildings such as Path A built in 23 and the MGM building 1936, which had small theaters to screen the films as well as rooms for sales, shipping and poster handling. Besides these distribution buildings, many studios such as Paramount, Columbia, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and United Artists were housed in two large film exchange buildings on First and Second Avenues, now the site of the Belltown Court Condominium. And these were designed by J. Lester Holmes, very modern. For the three extant downtown theaters, the Moore, the Fifth, the Paramount, there's renewed confidence that they will continue to provide Seattle with entertainment into the next century, at least after we have mastered the pandemic. For the many demolished theaters, the timing was wrong. While multiplex cinemas and home video continued to proliferate, they lacked the romance, the grace, extravagance, and cozy elegance of the older theaters. Foyers with overstuffed sofas, fireplaces, oriental carpets, grand pianos and promenades catered to the movie goer less as one of the masses than as the personally invited guest. New theaters don't duplicate the grand public spaces, the rich and showy materials and the awesome ambience of pre-depression vaudeville and motion picture palaces. Those fantasy lands where a pauper could feel like a king or a queen, if only for a few hours. According to Ben Hall in his book, The Best Remaining Seats, quote, the movie palace architect was an escape artist. It was his mission to build a new dream world for the disillusioned. And as he piled detail on detail, each prism, each gilded cherub, every jewel-eyed dragon became part of a whole, a feast for the eye, a catapult for the imagination. Well, thank you for joining me and learning a little bit more about Seattle's rich theater history. Thank you, Larry. That was great. Wow, you are a fountain of knowledge, of course. I, I expected no less. <laughs> um, now we have some time for questions. I don't see any yet, but if you have questions, let's start. Um, you can type them in the Q&A box. 
um, little bubbles down at the bottom of the screen. I guess I have a question um, if you will if you will answer it. Um, what is your favorite historic theater, Larry? You're talking about Seattle or you're talking yes, about, I'll talk about State. Seattle, I guess. But if you oh. have a outside of Seattle, that's that would be good to know, too. Well, actually, my favorite was the Fifth Avenue Theater, but um, I had an opportunity to do the research and landmark nomination for the Fox Theater in Spokane a number of years ago. And it's brilliant. And it shows the evolution of design into the Art Deco and capturing that character in, in the building by using the finest um, theatrical interior designer that was available at the time from uh, Los Angeles. Heinsberg and, um, and it, I, for me, it was, it was really Reamer's stretch into modernism from eclecticism. Um, so it's now, it's used by the, the Spokane Symphony, but um, in Seattle, I think the Fifth Avenue is, I mean, there is no replacement for it. It's just phenomenal. And every time you go, I've gone to a lot of performances there, the music, musicals and the comedies and, uh, Every time I go there, I listen to people's comments as they sit in their seats and look up and they are stunned. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it still has, it carries that, that excitement and um, delight mm -hmm. that you don't get going into the AMC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is beautiful. So we do have a few questions now. We have three. So first question, can you tell us more about what has become the triple door if you know um the triple door is below the dahlia the uh, dahlias okay so that was the embassy theater um and oh, below the uh so the building itself was called the embassy theater oh, third, yeah. third and uh union right yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a theater on the main floor and there was this, um, the theater, you came in on the main floor and then you, I, I believe you went down to the, the larger theater space. Um, and of course it, in the time when I was working for the city and was doing inventories downtown, I got into that space. It was a porno theater at the time. Um, so uh, now it's used in more of a nightclub fashion, I think. But the embassy was very much like the, the Colonial and the Liberty and all the other theaters that were uh, stacked around. Uh, in fact, it's just a half a block from the Winter Garden Theater, which was also on Third Avenue. So that was a, a theater row too. Someone, Brian asked, what, what was the Act Theater? You can see that it was once much more grand and now a new space built over the original seating bowl and much smaller. Act Theater moved into the Eagles Auditorium, which I showed you pictures of, and they um, they kept the the ballroom space, which had a uh, balcony around it. They installed the theater space that is in there now, but it can be removed. It's just um, it's using the historic structure, and then they also did several smaller theaters in the building. They had to remove some of the old uh, lodge rooms that were in the building originally. But uh, Henry Bittman loved to use terracotta in his buildings. And if you go through downtown's commercial district, there are many buildings by the firm. Right. Um, let's see. Someone at Ingrid asked, what do you know about Clemmers as theater promoters? Uh, I'm trying to find the right gray cell in the head. Um, Clemmer, um, uh, the family had theaters initially in Spokane, I believe. And there is a, uh, a theater that's still there that was a Clemmer theater. And then they did do theater theaters in Seattle. Um, I don't know much about them. Sorry. Um, let's see. Stephanie asked, um, she said, thank you, Larry. She said, downtown theaters were so beautiful. Do you know if there's any documentation of stories told by performers, movie staff, or people who access the theaters? Well, uh, a woman named Laura Drake 
um, had researched, um, she was interested in the vaudevillians who performed in these theaters and she interviewed them. She had oral interviews with many of the, the old time vaudevillians before they left the, this, this earth. And um, she's a great source. Um, she um, helped orchestrate a performance by these retired vaudevillians at the, the Museum of History and Industry when we did the exhibit in, in 1981. Um, I, if somebody wants her contact information, I can give it to you. She ran a uh, children's uh, youth theater in West Seattle for many years. Let's see, another question. Do you, do you know what would happen to the materials gleaned before demolition, the marble, et cetera? Well, when we did the theater exhibit in 1981, I was able to borrow a quarter of the chandelier from the Orpheum Theater that had been stored in somebody's garage for years. Um, you know, there, was a, there were salvage pieces from a lot of these demolished theaters. Certainly the music hall theater got uh, a lot of publicity for um, the uh, demolition person's efforts to salvage a lot of the cast stone from the building exterior. Um, and people did purchase those. Although I, I think that a lot of them are sitting in landfill at this point because nobody, you know, the intent was maybe somebody would reuse these. The same holds true for the old JC Penney building which was the Fraser Patterson store on, on um, Second Avenue and, and uh, Pike where Allied Arts found a, Allied Arts decided they wanted to at least preserve the facade, which is a wonderful deco uh, cast stone facade. And it's sitting on pallets in somebody's uh, backyard somewhere in North Seattle, because nobody came forward to say, this would be a wonderful idea for an adaptive reuse or for my facade of my building. So some of this stuff ends up um, not being used again. Um, so we have another one from Sally. Hmm, this is Does, doesn't the parent have seats that can be flipped into the floor so that the floor can be flat? The Paramount does. Okay. They spent a fair amount of money doing that so that they could have um, uh, dance dance floor and uh, place for tables and chairs for you know banquets and events. Um, that's become more and more common in, in uh, trying to think of adaptive reuses for these large spaces. Do you know, Larry, is there a recommended book about the history of Seattle theaters? No. <laughs> Short answer. There, there, I, I have a couple of articles that I could send people. Yeah. Um, let's see, this is, oh, from Martha. Is there anything you can tell us about the Baghdad Theater in Ballard that was part of the Eagles building at 22nd and Market? Uh, I cannot. It's not, not in my, my mind. I will tell you, um, there are places to research historic theaters, however. Um, when I was doing the exhibit in 1980, 81, there was a man named Chris Scullerid who had been for years collecting file card notes on Seattle theaters and also photographs. And that's at the Sophie Bass Library at Mohai. Um, there are uh, photographs of the, uh, some of the photographs that I was showing from the 20s and 30s uh, by this person who documented the street life and the exteriors of some of the theaters. Um, Historic Seattle has two binders of photographs taken by this person. And they're really a wealth of information and that actually, one of the binders held these, these maps that B. Marcus Pratika did in the 40s of, um, of the, where the theaters were. Um, but the University of Washington Special Collections um, and uh, Museum of History and Industry Library um, and the Seattle Room at the Seattle Public Library all have theater resources. You just need to know what you're, what you're looking for or how to look. Um, let's see. And Larry, someone asked for those articles. So if you want to share them with me, I'm happy to send them out with the link of your recording, by the way. Okay, I can do that. Um, let's see. Someone asked, do you own anything from the demolished theaters from an auction? <laughs> do you have any treasures? 
that you wanted to talk Oddly about? Oddly enough, <laughs> I have a stained glass exit sign from a theater, a, a movie theater that was demolished in Cedar Woolley, Washington, that I founded in an antique store years ago. I do not have any um, theater materials, um, actual original materials from theaters. Okay. But I do, if you hold on a second. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Let's see what I can do. That was in the presentation. Can you see it better this way? <laughs> ah. That's the that's the Pantages poster um, that I, I showed. That the original um, watercolor uh, of this is in uh, the Museum of History and Industry collection. Cool. Yeah, I think it's a museum. I can't remember if it's that or UW. We have just a couple more questions here. One um, says, although not historic in the sense of theaters that you talked about, do you know the future of this Zinorama? I don't, but it looks pretty dim at this point. Yeah, I know that um, Vulcan has kind of shuttered a lot of their entertainment venues, and this was one of them. So I don't know if it will reopen or uh, what that is, but that's just what I've read in the public. So. And I can't remember whether it actually is a designated landmark or not at this point. It probably should have been for its importance, um, but I can't remember whether that was ever processed. Um, otherwise, it's a development site for more buildings if we need more buildings after the pandemic. So a couple more questions. They just keep coming now. Oh. Uh, do you know anything about the history of the State Theater in Olympia from Brian? That's not the Capitol Theater? Mm, I don't know if that's what you meant, Brian. I don't know about the State Theater. Um, no, so about the I do know oh, about the Pantages. The current, the current Harlequin is what you said. The Harlequin. No, I do not. No. And then someone asked, Kat asked, did the Banana Republic close? And if so, any news on what will happen? Um, and I just, Larry and I just realized it closed when we were getting ready for this. So it did oh, close. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we couldn't, we didn't find anything on what was going to happen. So. No. Well, in the old days, I used to do tours of theater in downtown and um, the people, the Banana Republic people were willing to direct us to this, the staircase that went up to the balcony. So you could go up to the balcony with a small group and um, it's kind of scary, it's dark, but you could look at the stars up ahead you know, and the ceiling and you could see the gargoyle figures, figurines that were on the on the sidewalls. So um, it's still there intact, but not really a, a place that I can see being renovated interiorly. Um, and then I guess uh, one more question. Are there pictures available of the swimming pool in the basement of the Moore Theater? I have not come across them, but I would think that somebody might have them. Um, yeah, I don't know what that was like. Um, there are certainly swimming pictures of the swimming pool that was in the natatorium, the crystal pool, uh, mm -hmm. which B. Marcus Pratika did um, the year before the, he did the work on the Colosseum. I think it opened in 1914. Um, and that was his building with the terracotta facade with the dolphins in um, on the facade. Um, but it was a swimming pool before it was covered over for a church. Okay. Any last questions? Oh, oh, haha. <laughs> Brian says, I think we all know who should write the book on the history of Seattle theaters. <laughs> Let me know when you find you. it. You. <laughs> so in your in your spare time. Well, thank you. I hope it's been a little bit more revealing to people. It's it's hard in this city that we walk through every day to imagine how how many theaters were were there. There was a picture I showed early on of Second Avenue, which showed the Florence Theater, which was right next ah. to the, the Smith Tower. And um, the Florence was also, a, you know, a vaudeville house. And then it became more of a porno theater. And, oh, um, no. <laughs> and um, I remember that, that I 
gave this talk to Horizon House uh, one year. And besides having a 90 plus year old vaudevillian step up and say that she performed in one of these houses, uh, Jane Hastings, an architect who many of you may know, uh, said that when she was a teenager, she was supposed to go to an audition there. And her mother was frightened of her going to this nasty place in this nasty part of town to uh, go there in the afternoon and do an audition. So 